Hi guys, so let's now take a look at free trade areas. So this is of course one of the first steps involved in actually integrating economically. Now these free trade areas, they can be bilateral, which represents two member countries, or they can be multilateral agreements, which reflects a trading block of countries, uh, which is three or more of course. So let's take a look. They occur when at least two countries, bilateral agreement, uh, partially or fully remove tariffs on their inner border. They may have very, very different external policies. Uh, they may have fairly similar external policies, but they won't have a common external policy. Uh, now, a trade block will reflect multilateral agreement. Okay, so that is, of course, where we've got three or more countries being involved. Great examples of free trade areas. Well, we've got the Central European Free Trade Agreement. Uh, now, that represents, of course, the Central European countries, uh, such as uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and so on. Uh, and Now, examples of free trade areas include the Central Euro European Free Trade Agreement, that we've got the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, we've then also got the uh, Greater Arab Free Trade Agreement for those countries in uh, uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East, such as uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, then we've also got the South, South Asian Free Trade Agreement as well. So there's numerous examples that can be cited in relation to this uh, these types of free trade areas. So the potential benefits, first up, increased exports. Right, increased exports would therefore mean aggregate demand increases. That would then mean that you'd be able to use an aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram if you'd want to in your essay, uh, together with being able to reflect also on that same diagram, inward investment. Now, both of these areas you would hope would help to uh, boost uh, boost employment and boost economic output, of course. Now, there may be an impact on uh, the price of inputs as well, and that is because you now have removed those tariff barriers, uh, and as such, you might be able to get hold of inputs uh, for your manufacturers at a much cheaper level, which will make the actual final product that your manufacturers produce cheaper, perhaps, and more competitive. Uh, so that's another great point. Many people miss that out completely, okay? They don't think about uh, the manufacturers within a home country. They simply think about consumers, so there you go. Uh, you can exploit economies of scale, of course. If you increase uh, your output to cater for a larger market, uh, it means that you can exploit a lower average unit cost. Uh, there's going to be increased competition, so you've got competition from abroad. This is going to breed efficiency as well as greater choice. Together, these elements will help to improve product quality, so that's also good. And of course, we've got the exploitation of comparative advantage, which is no longer distorted by any uh, trade impediments. So that's very, very useful. Potential drawbacks, well, the inability to actually use protectionism. Some governments may see that as a real drawback. Certainly Donald Trump has cited that in relation to NAFTA. Uh, now, there's also the infant industry argument that you may want to actually protect some of your infant industries from foreign competition. Um, so that's another interesting one because now you won't be able to actually do that. Uh, now there could also be the loss of tariff revenue if you have had to get rid of your tariffs and uh, that, that may pose some, some problems perhaps for the government. Then what about strategic industries? Are you going to protect those industries? Is that going to be within your free trade agreement so that you actually negotiate that in advance? Uh, now. Also, when it comes to these free trade areas, they can, depending upon the types of countries that actually come together, cause structural changes. Now, within NAFTA is an example there with Canada, America and Mexico. Of course, Mexico is the uh, lowest cost producer. As such, it has caused st uh, structural changes to the manufacturing industry uh, in America, it's argued. Now, as such... 
Um, what does that mean for that workforce? Are you actually thinking about what provisions can actually be made? And we'll come to that in our evaluative point. Uh, but it can certainly cause structural unemployment. And what about small businesses? Will they be able to survive? Will they be able to compete with multinational corporations or very large companies? Certainly, this sort of uh, agreement is likely to really benefit larger companies that really can exploit those economies of scale. So let's round this up in real style here, guys. Uh, so what about the impact on differing economic agents? You can break that down for the consumer-based impact. We've said about the price of inputs on uh, home firm manufacturers. Um, so will that actually make them more competitive rather than actually causing structural unemployment within them? It depends, doesn't it? Okay, So you can really target specific areas and you get a lot of marks for that detail. So that's important. What about the short-term benefits versus the longer-term costs, perhaps? So the short-term benefits might be that increased competition, greater choice, better quality, lower prices. Um, but in the longer term, those structural changes can be very painful. Uh, now, what about uh, the provision for that structural adjustment that may, uh, may actually be foreseeable. So what can the government actually do to ensure that uh, manufacturing uh, workers will have jobs in the future irrespective of what happens to their industry? It's a very, very difficult argument to tackle that. Okay, but that's likely to be about supply side reforms really uh, targeting those specific areas in the industrial heartland. Uh, and finally, UK's current scenario. So you could also consider the UK's current scenario. Uh, we haven't yet left the European Union, so we're not free to actually determine our own uh, agreements, but in time we will be. Uh, now, will we be adjusting for uh, bilateral or will we be looking at multi multilateral agreements? Uh, so you can certainly consider what is currently taking place within the EU uh, and the UK. And I really suggest you keep up to date with that information. You get a lot of marks for uh, showing that real relevance to current practice. Great stuff, guys. I hope that's been useful. See you next time.